this is a reading from, from my book, uh, The uh, Internet is Infected. The world, our world needs the ultimate cybersecurity guide for small business and home computing. Uh, it just doesn't seem like many small businesses or home computer users were interested, but looking back, I think I was uh, censored. Uh, I think that places like, you know, because I sent out 100 books for review and never got a single phone call and never got a review. Looking back, I think I was on the, uh, I call it, you know, the three-letter agency. I call them the Eye of Sauron. I think I was up on the Eye of Sauron uh, list, and uh, they weren't going to let anybody talk to me about this book. Uh, which the book will be freely available here shortly once I get my interview uh, because it is somewhat dated. It's 2016, and if I do get interest in the book after this interview, then uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and make a, a, a three-volume set uh, of the book. Sorry about that. I forgot my glasses. And uh, so, but in the book, you know, of course... I just want to give you a couple of things. I detail uh, everything about Edward Snowden that you can ever imagine. So if you've just wanted to learn about the saga of Edward Snowden, I mean, he, he revealed five different uh, data collection uh, programs that uh, the NSA was doing. I mean, you want to talk, the, the United States government, if you didn't understand it by now, is the enemy of the American people. And, uh, and so in my book, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to help you to fight against uh, the enemy of the people. Now, of course, you know, here I've got a hacker on the left, a thief, a scorned lover, the U.S. government and corporations. Now, all of these are vectors to attack against you in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world. And, uh, and of course, you know, I, I talk about the, the normal stuff, you know, change your password, you know, all the talking heads you hear on, in the mainstream media that don't tell you anything. But I did want to get into, because I did a lot of, uh, I'm a historian, and if I was going to write this book, I, I wanted to get into some things that I found very interesting. Now, I'll give you the story, uh, the background here was, my best friend uh, was dying, and uh, I, had, I drove down from Michigan to Richmond, Virginia, to, to sit by his side, and I watched him die for about uh, three weeks. Uh, you know, every night I sat with him. Uh, and just, you know, I read, to, actually I was reading at the time from my book, uh, just keeping him company. I don't know if he ever heard a word I said. He was mostly uh, passed out as I looked at him dying in the bed. But anyway, so uh, I, I took advantage. There's, you know, if, if, I don't know if it's still true today, but I went to the Richmond Library. And I, it's the, they call it the Civil War Library. And in there, they've got all the original, di well, they had back then. They might not anymore. It's probably been you know, bonfired because, you know, we're tearing down statues and destroying our history. But at that time, all of the original documents from uh, Longstreet and Pettigrew uh, and, of course, Pickett, uh, they actually brought them out. I mean, the original letters that the correspondence that was taking place during the Battle of Gettysburg, it was, I mean, I, I, I just felt like I was on another planet. I mean, here I am looking at something from 18, what was that, 1861 or two I, when the Battle of Gettysburg took place. But let's just get into the reading here. So historical reference, the charge of Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble was the climax of the Battle of Get 1863. Here it is in my book. The most disastrous infantry attack uh, on, Amer on the American soil and the largest infantry battle on the American continent ever. Why, <clears throat> why Lee and Longstreet decided to take an inferior and less well-equipped Northern Army to fight a superior uh, force who would establish a well-fortified entrenched defense position will be a subject of speculation for all time. Kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? Exactly what the Ukrainians did against the Russians. See how ra uh, history rhymes and repeats itself? From Civil War times, Shelby Foote, Foot, F-O-O-T-E, makes the case for a rebel offensive. A move into Pennsylvania might or might not cause the withdrawal of Ulysses Grant from the uh, from in front of Vicksburg, right now I mean that was back when remember the Battle of Vicksburg. So Grant was down there uh, blowing up Vicksburg. I guess they thought that this gambit might uh, draw his forces away from Vicksburg. I don't see how that would have been possible, but uh, let's keep going. But at least it would remove the invaders from the soil of Virginia during the vital harvest season. Emphasis, Allen Barra. While at best it could accomplish the fall of the northern capital and thus encourage the foreign uh, intervention uh, with Jefferson Davis 
long as seen as the key to victory of the superior forces of the Union. So this is, of course, me now. So we can see the, uh, the invasion of the North was a calculated but desperate gamble by the South, who saw this as their only hope of winning the war. When fighting began on Jan July 1st, Major General George Meade had 51 brigades in infantry and 7 of cavalry, comprised of nearly 80,000 men. While General Lee, with Jeb Stewart's cavalry still away from the main body, had perhaps 50,000 men, 34 brigades of infantry, and just one cavalry. Thus, the Federals began the fight with an 8-5 to five advantage. Why in the world? I, I don't even understand what, the, what Lee was thinking. That's why everybody says Robert E. Lee was such a great general. I, I think, like I said, Stonewall Jackson, in my opinion, was a better general. During the first two days of fighting, the Army of Northern Virginia was able to inflict heavier casualties on the Federals. But by the third day, Lee's options were to retreat or find the most uh, vulnerable place in the Union defense and try an all-out assault, hoping that the Union lines would break. Given the mindset of that era, a retreat would have meant that Lee and his army would leave the field of battle and disgrace, having not to at least have tried to overrun the Union's defenses. Kind of a weird mindset, huh? Uh, you're going to sacrifice a bunch of human beings uh, because you, your pride is going to get hurt. So Lee chose the weakest point and massed his troops and cannon against it. However, even the weakest point in a defensive line can stand against superior numbers and firepower if the position is unattainable. Lee's generals argued against this frontal assault on a position where the Union was on high ground with a mile of open terrain for the South to cover before the enemy could be engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Longstreet argued vehemently against the attack, so much so that he bordered on insubordination. Longstreet has quoted numerous sources as saying, no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle could take that position. From Robert E. Lee by Douglas Stonewall Freeman, Longstreet told Lee, I have had my scouts out all night, and I find that you still have an opportunity to move around the right of Meade's army and maneuver him into attacking us. Longstreet was right. Longstreet was right. Longstreet felt that if they threatened Washington, D.C., Meade would have no choice but to move his army off the high ground to confront Lee's army on the ground of their choosing. Longstreet believed that Lee so strongly about that that he had already given the order to his troop to move to the right. Ultimately, Lee overruled Longstreet, Riding away and is quoted as saying, Never was I so depressed as that day. Longstreet was listless and despairing after the argument, and his eyes remained fixated upon the ground. So you can imagine when you know, it's kind of like me in my cybersecurity career, when you know you're right, and especially, you know, when you know your commander's making the wrong decision, and you know your men are going to die as a result, I mean, I can't imagine what he was thinking. It's almost like Lee was working for the Union. So let's keep going. The Union commanders, commanders were able to predict Lee's moves as well. So it seems his moves weren't very inventive or secret. You could possibly pronounce this as a last-ditch effort of a very desperate commander. Lee began the battle in Napoleonic style by arraying 160 cannons, which stretched for over two miles to bombard the Union position on Cemetery Ridge. Against the rebels stood 100 Union cannons. For two hours, the Confederates bombarded the Union line, lines with cannons, hoping to take them out and weaken their defenses. To imagine what this is like, this was the greatest concentration of artillery and the largest artillery barrage, barrage that has ever existed on the American continent. It could be heard 40 miles away in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. In the heated exchange of cannon, the Union wisely held back cannon and shot in reserve and eventually had to pull back the limited cannon they were using to let them cool before overheating because of overheating. The Union version of the story was that the Union commanders silenced their guns to lure the Confederates into an infantry attack that they knew was coming. Confederate Colonel Edward P. Alexander mistook this lull and lack of cannon fire to mean that the barrage had destroyed most of the Union canyon, cannon, while, when in fact the bar bomb bombardment had inflicted little damage to the Union canyon, cannon or their infantry. Lee had entrusted him as to when, or if, to order Pickett to begin the infantry attack. 
So if you don't understand Napoleonic cannon, it's just basically, you know, it's a frontal cannon and it's used, a, it's got, it, I, I want to say it's a short range cannon, but I can't believe they were able to hit the ridge from a mile away. And I, I can't imagine how they thought that this type of cannon was going to uh, destroy the Union Canyon. I mean, all, all they had, exactly what they did. All they had to do was pull it back off of the ridge. And I'm sure that, that all these cannonballs were just hitting dirt up there. And especially since they're up on the hill, you can't see, you know, uh, it's, it's not like they had drone technology back then or airplanes. How are you going to know that you've killed the cannon? I mean, this is the stupidest attack ever. At 3 p.m., the rebel cannon stopped firing, and the 12,500 rebel infantry, which stretched a mile long, began their assault as the Union brought up their rifle cannon that they had held in reserve, as well as the cannon that had now cooled down, to begin the slaughter. Civil War Volume 2 states, Pickett, saddened by the dreadful waste of life he foresaw, tears filling his eyes, stood in front of his three brigades and shouted, Charge the en enemy and remember old Virginia. Oh, God, I can't imagine. The Confederates began marching at 100 and 110 steps per minute across the mile-long open field, which would end with a race uphill to what remained of their soldiers to reach the Union lines. The Union began using the three-inch ordnance rifle cannon invented just two years earlier. See, this is a, I've talked about advancements in technology. And Lee didn't understand how the rifle cannon had changed the battlefield. You can't do a frontal assault across an open field against a, a rifle cannon, but we'll get into that. Let's see. Invented just two years earlier, which made with four and a half inch rod iron. The cannon had a three inch groove bore engineered for deadly accuracy. These cannons began tearing into the rebel infantry with shells that were exploded upon impact as well as time shells, which had been engineered to burst over top of the now exposed Confederate ranks, raining down death from above. From Civil War, Volume 2, of uh, Union, Volume 2, excuse me, uh, Union gunners feverishly fired shells into the huge columns. Men, it was said, fell like ten pins. About halfway through the assault, the rebels came into rage of the smooth-style uh, Napoleonic cannon, which which made them continued target practice for the Union artillery. When the rebels reached 400 yards, the Union soldiers loaded the cannon with canister, which are 10 cans packed with 28 iron balls. These shots mowed down 20 or more troops at a time. Entire companies of rebel soldiers ceased to exist. The remaining troops fell under Union musket fire as they approached the Union lines. In one hour... In one hour, Pickett's division lost 2,882 officers and men, killed, wounded, and missing. That figure represents a staggering 62% casualty rate. 31 of Pickett's majors were killed, wounded, or missing. All three brigadier generals were casualties. Within Pettigrew's and Trimble's commands, the losses were equally great. Some 3,585 officers and men were casualties nearly 56%. Nearly all of Pettigrew's regiments returned without their field grade commanders. Marshall's, Pettigrew's, and Davis's brigades each lost a ghastly 74%. Some companies lost over 90% of their officers and men, while three companies, the University Grays and the 11th Mississippi, the color company of the 38th North Carolina Infantry and the Company F of the 26th North Carolina were totally wiped out. Taken from statement as to where the general was was during the charge, why the attack failed, as told by Robert A. Bright. As the charge ended and the retreat began, General R.B. Lee, the peerless, alone on the traveler, rode up and said, General Pickett, place your division in the rear of this hell and be ready to repel the advance of the enemy should they follow up on their advantage. I never heard General Lee call them the enemy before. It was always those those people. General Pickett, with his head in his breast, said, General Lee, I have no division now. Armsteed is down, Garnet is down, and Kemper is mortally wounded. General Pickett never forgave Lee for the disaster wreaked upon his command in Pennsylvania. Pickett was the one officer who wrote a derogatory report about the battle, but apparently even Lee ordered him to destroy it because he was so bitter. Or Lee himself tore up the letter and no copy has ever been found. 
The sources for these possible reports are Wirt, Jeffrey D. Gettysburg, Day 3, New York, Simon & Schuster, 2001. The other possibility is Lee tore it up himself, uh, is from Civil War, Volume 2, under Justice for Our Dead is All We Want. The report is the role of his division in the Battle of Gettysburg was destroyed on Lee's orders. It was too cynical. Pickett suffered most of the blame for this disaster, and for nine years after his death, General Pickett's grave remained unmarked. Can you imagine getting blamed for something like this? It's a hell of a story. It is horrible. And you see how I'm citing all of my sources uh, for, for this. Uh, probably just just writing this uh, would have constituted, you know, a, a, a huge dissertation for, for um, any sort of uh, college paper. Lee's education and spirits, uh, this is me now, of course. I, Lee's education experience was such that he did not realize how advances in weapons technology had made a frontal charge against a defensible position, a foolhardy endeavor. He certainly did not understand how the advances in cannon and cannon ammunition had changed how frontal assaults should be made. Many historians view this one-hour battle as the turning point of the war. I do, too. I think that, that this, was, this was the end of the South. This one battle. One, can you imagine one hour of one day decided the whole war? Uh, anyway, let's just keep going. Through a confluence of misinformation, exhausted soldiers, weather, and other factors, Lee was able to withdraw to Virginia with the two-thirds of his remaining army intact. However, the South fought a defensive battle for the remainder of the war, never again attacking the North. It could be argued that Pickett's charge was the quintus to the South's cause. Uh, a victory at Gettysburg was vital for the South's hopes for aid and would have demoralized the Northern troops and civilians. My belief is that Lee also hoped to destroy some of Northern's infrastructure by laying waste to the cities and countryside before the North could regroup and counterattack. Lee had to know that with the North's manufacturing infrastructure in superior numbers, the South was destined to lose the war, just like Ukraine was destined to lose the war because of Russia's uh, infrastructure and in, in their industry. It, you know, there's no way that, that Ukraine was ever going to win that war. And, and if you know anything about uh, history, it, everybody said that, except for the Pentagon, those boot-licking idiots, uh, Ivy League graduates up there that run our military. There's no way for Lee to anticipate how the ever-advancing weapons technology would continue to change the field of battle. His Napoleonic form of attack proves he was a connoisseur. He was a connoisseur of history. No one could have predicted how the coming rapid-fire weapons that the North would later produce would hasten the war's conclusion. Still, he had to have known that the South's ability to out South's ability to outmass produce the North in wep weapons was not feasible. With or without this foolhardy charge, the South was doomed to lose the war without foreign aid. It is certain that this one hour of mass carnage hastened the demise of the South. Towards the end of the war, Sherman's march showed what, what was possible if the South had, had won the day. Sherman destroyed the South's ability to wage war by destroying the South's agriculture, weapons manufacturing, transportation, and infrastructure. You can read about this epic battle in the Encyclopedia of Virginia.org, Pickett S. Charge, and the Encyclopedia of Virginia is online at the www.virginiafoundation.org. All right, so, and of course, in my book, you know, I'm, I'm expressing, I hope, about this, about reading this historical tra tra tragedy helps you understand how advancing technology could possibly destroy your home computer user or small business uh, internet life. If you work for a business or corporation large enough to have an information department, those IT folks can probably provide a virtual private network set up to allow employees to connect to corporate network. And then, of course, I go on from there, and that's why, that's why I tell these stories, because I want to show you how military history relates to cybersecurity. So I hope that reading you found interesting. You probably passed out now. <laughs> if you actually got through the whole reading, I mean, you know. But, I mean, some people don't like to read. Some people just like to uh, listen to it. I, I wish I could have put up some, some charts and some graphs and done some fancy stuff. But hell, just writing that uh, and reading it took long enough, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, holy moly. I only got so much time for these videos. That's it for my reading from my book, uh, The Pickett's Charge. Hope you found it entertaining. I know I did rereading it. It's, uh, 
It's almost horrific. To, it's so horrific to think about, and that's what Ukraine's going through right now. Peace out. Stay free.